Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm really excited about today's topic. It has to do with making metal and the forest. And this is part of that story. Have you ever seen one of these and wondered what was going on? Well, my name is Adam Downing with Virginia Cooperative Extension and I've got three special guests with me today. And so I hope you'll enjoy this trip with me for 15 minutes in the forest. Hi, my name is Kane Harbison. I'm a forester with the Virginia Department of Forestry. I cover three counties in the Shenandoah work area. Today we're in Page County at Catherine Furnace talking about pig iron. Um, so the history of pig iron, major component of pig iron production is charcoal. Well, to get charcoal, you've got to have trees. If you look around us, most of these trees at the time this furnace was operating would have been cut, would have been gone by the time that this furnace stopped operation. Um, Feeding these beasts took a lot of wood, took a lot of charcoal. Um, in most of the literature, the common number you see is up to 300 acres cut per year. And most of these furnaces ran between 30 and 60 years, averaging somewhere around the 40 year mark. Even a conservative estimate of you know, 275 acres per year. And you multiply that out by 40 years, you get 11,000 acres cut and consumed to create charcoal for these furnaces. Multiply that by the number of furnaces across the area, which Norman Scott catalogs 31 different furnaces operating in the six counties that our office cover. You get a conservative estimate of 341,000 acres. Timber consumed by these furnaces is larger than the amount of, total amount of land in Shenandoah County. And really, we're still living with a lot of the after effects every day that I meet with landowners. We're still seeing the after effects in our um, forests. Um, the mass harvest that we're going on really kicked off a cycle of just, I don't want to say abusing, but they were abusing the forest. So that's the challenge that we're dealing with today is just trying to correct or you know, manage better the forests that are the direct result of starting here, you know, mismanagement. I'm John Coleman, retired from the Forest Service here on the Lee District of the George Washington National Forest in, uh, in Virginia. Land was all owned by uh, iron companies. It made a tremendous impact on the, what, we, what we have now. And the way they did it, they go to the woods and uh, almost year round, and cut the trees and make charcoal out on the site out in the forest. And they would bring it in here and put it up in the storage-like shed, one-sided one, over across the creek. And uh, that was one component of it. Another component was uh, iron ore itself, which they dug out of these mountains. And the other component was limestone, which served as a uh, flux to flux off the impurities in the iron ore. And, they sited this furnace here because of these two streams. The power that powered everything was water power. Okay, over here's the creek and uh, the other creeks out there and it, it the water was captured and brought in here on in uh, flumes and the uh, there's part of it and it had an undershot wheel that the water went under it and turned it like that. And that ran two tub bellows. Uh, and they would be an alternate stroke. So they maintained a constant flow of blast of air because you needed that to uh, get the temperature of that charcoal fire up to melt iron. They loaded the furnace with those three things, iron ore, limestone, and charcoal from across the creek here. And that big rock wall is uh, the, where they a bridge was started and came to the top of the furnace, which is open. They dump it in there and start the fire, keep it in blast, they called it, for as long as they could. They melted the iron ore and uh, this iron has settled down to a point in here. And the, the, uh, the guy that ran the furnace had to have all kinds of skill. And uh, it's an art, and it's not a measured thing. And anyway, when he got ready to uh, float the iron off, there was a big sand bed here that uh, was covered with just a shed roof. 
and they had the sand bed laying here, sloping a little bit downhill, and they uh, had holes, and they made a main trough for it, an ingot mold, which would they all he did was take a wooden mold and push it in the sand and bring that little uh, depression to it. They fill it up, they they cut it off with their hole and go to the next one and go down filling up ingots. They led the molten iron into those pigs, they called them, because they looked like piglets feeding on mama in the main channel there. This thing is just like a big pear inside with a with a belt, big uh, chamber down here and smaller at the top. And it's lined with uh, bricks that made some place in the area out there in the valley. And they, they turn the heat to keep it from heating these rocks, which explode once in a while. Well, we're standing here at the, just close, real close to the furnace. And that rock wall behind us was a storage shed, for, mainly for charcoal. And they also stored iron ore and uh, limestone. We're about two miles from the furnace. I think we're standing in an old uh, collier's hearth where they made charcoal. They were always tr flat. You can find them in the woods because there's, you can still identify a man-made cut at the top of the slope because everything slopes around here. And uh, that would be their hearth. Then they would take a uh, sizable timber tree and put it in the middle and set it in the ground as a post. Woodcutters are ahead of them cutting, and they're cutting stuff in four foot lengths. Guys that tended the hearth came along and got that wood and brought it in, and they leaned it up against it on a little bit of an angle so it wouldn't fall over. And then they kept making ranks around that. And before they got two or three ranks up, they climbed up on the top of it and uh, made another rank and they kept bringing it out like that. Then of all things, they covered it with dirt and leaves robbed the air from the fire. Uh, they have four or five or six of these things in their area. They made them a ladder and they went up on the top and they already had put some kindling down on the bottom by the big pole. And they had a, maybe they got a scoop of their campfire where they cooked breakfast and climbed up there and dumped it in there. And then began the torture of staying awake, one of them, and rotating between those hearths because if if, uh, if they burned out a hole, you had to they had to get that immediately patched up, or they were going to lose all that time and energy. When they were satisfied that it was charcoal, they would pull a little of the dirt and leaves off and spread it out, and then they would uh, have wagons come along some roads, and they would. Uh, put the charcoal in baskets and carry it to get it in the wagon. And the wagons, they say, had a sliding floor. And when they got down to the uh, furnace and up on those places we saw that had a rock wall, they would take the wagon under there, a chain or something that was on the sliding floor of the wagon, put it on the team they brought them, and they would pull that out and poof, all the charcoal would fall in, under the roof. That's kind of the story of making charcoal. Hello, I'm Norman Scott, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm an amateur historian, and um, I just um, I have taken on the project of uh, researching and writing about the iron smelting history of Virginia's Valley. I've just become interested in the iron smelting industry, primarily because I grew up in Clifton Forge, and um, uh, obviously by its name, it was um, a iron, major iron smelting area of, of the valley. And as a youth in high school, I would roam the mountains and discover the old iron mines and the remnants of the iron furnaces and whatnot. Uh, iron production uh, in the Virginia Valley was done really in three kind of eras. One was the Bloomery Forge era. The next was the uh, coal blast charcoal furnace era, and then finally the hot blast coke furnace era. Now the Bloomery Forge area s started as soon as the um, settlers came into the valley, uh, and they would would build these very simple Bloomery Forges, and this is in the 1700s when the valley was first settled. And uh, but by 1830, the 
the, they weren't producing enough iron to supply all the iron needs of the valley, and they began to build the iron furnace. This was the coal blast charcoal furnace. And this was a uh, very large stone truncated pyramid, about 30 feet high. Then um, the Civil War uh, came along, and um, uh, by then the, the uh, charcoal coal blast furnace had pretty well uh, seen its end, but the the, the war caused the, the, uh, them to be uh, kind of reinstated because the uh, South needed iron. And uh, But after the war, of course, um, the uh, money was no good, the uh, slaves were no longer available for the furnaces, uh, and those uh, closed. And uh, it was probably not until the 1880s that um, the technology had changed so that they were now using uh, coke for fuel. And these very, very large furnaces were then um, uh, being built in many of the same locations as the old charcoal furnaces. And that lasted until uh, 1920. Research that I was able to do, I was able to locate uh, over 100 iron furnaces in the Virginia Valley. That was a lot of iron production. It was a big, big business then. The iron plantation, um, actually consisted of the furnace, but it also consisted of a, of a, a foundry, a blacksmith shop, but also, too, you had to have a staff of workers. Uh, so many of the iron plantations had their own farms where they raised their beef, pigs, chickens. Now, these plantations operated um, uh, differently than a, an agricultural plantation that you might have found in the eastern part of, 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 of Virginia and in the south. So the quality of this iron was important. Well, um, you know, you had to make sure that you had workers who were concerned about quality of iron. Now, w when the valley was first settled, uh, especially in the northern part, in the Shenandoah Valley area, um, uh, many of the uh, people that came down um, and started iron furnaces were um, of a religious sect that didn't believe in slavery. And so they were just totally opposed to having uh, slaves work. There just weren't enough people around the valley at the time uh, to, to run an iron plantation. So uh, over time, uh, and use slave labor. Now at first, um, they would uh, rent slaves. And they would go to the east, uh, to the plantation, to the agricultural plantations, and they would rent uh, workers to come during the off season, uh, which meant that uh, is usually the winter time. There were certain requirements. There was a regular contract that, that had to be signed. And, and interestingly enough, the the slaves were required to be returned home for Christmas, and the the, the iron um, plantation owners had to provide shoes for the slaves. So they would train the slave um, to, to, to do the quality work necessary. Well, then they'd send him back home um, to the eastern plantation, and the next year, all of a sudden, the um, eastern plantation owner said, well, I want more for this guy because he's now skilled. The iron plantation owners quickly found out that the slave labor rented was not going to work. So they began to start owning their own slaves. Um, so it would mean that uh, during this time, between about 1830 and maybe right after the Civil War, um, between 19,000 and 23,000 acres of forest had been cleared. Uh, that's a lot of forest. And that's for just the five furnaces at the Massanutten area. If you talk about this, 70 or so furnaces throughout the Virginia Valley, then you can do the math and you can see that the forests were really just about disappeared. It's interesting to note that um, England was a, a major um, experimenter in using uh, non-charcoal for their furnaces. In fact, they got ahead of the United States by using coke first. And why was that? Because they cut down all their trees. <laughs> they didn't have any charcoal left, any trees left to make charcoal anymore. So that's a lesson to be learned, I think. Well, I hope you enjoyed that walk through the forest and history for the past 15 minutes. And maybe have a new appreciation for when we see things like this that are so beautiful today, they weren't always that way.